2023 has been one of the best years for video games that we have ever had. Unless you're Redfall. Or Starfield. Or Gollum. Or King Kong. Or the day before. Or are basically made by Activision Blizzard, like, remotely at all. So maybe 2023 wasn't the single best year in gaming that so many people claimed. That doesn't matter, because that's never stopped devs from making groundbreaking, innovative, and just overall amazing games in both this year and ones before it. In the year 2023, I played around 40 different video games, some in the coziness of my couch, and others I streamed here on this channel. Today, I want to talk about the absolute best 5 of those 40 games that I have played. Not all will have been released in 2023, but hopefully one of them will make it to your list by the end of this new year. How's it going everybody? I'm Gab the Kerbazoid, and let's talk about the best games I've played in 2023. You arrive on Earth, but this isn't the same home you knew before you left to live on Mars. It's empty, void of all human life, and all the buildings we took pride in are now reclaimed by the flora and fauna that have been slaughtered and torn to build them. You enter this familiar yet ruined world with nothing but your spacesuit and a golf club and set out to visit Memory Lane one last time. Originally an Apple Arcade game, Golf Club Nostalgia, formerly known as Golf Club Wasteland, is a 2D golf game where you play golf in a post-apocalyptic Earth, where only the rich and wealthy survived such apocalypse by colonizing Mars. While the golf itself is fun to get the hang of, the single best part of this game is its storytelling. There is no dialogue in this game. Instead, everything that you need to know about the world around you is the beautiful yet haunting landscape and the radio that you're listening to. You'll be listening to interviews with the people now living on Mars, including host segments where he gives local updates about the cold, lifeless planet that the remaining human race are now forced to call home. Not even mentioning the amazing music that will play in between while you try to get that birdie. It's a story of corporate greed, trauma, regret, and accepting the mess you're in and being happy with it. If you're looking to justify your hate for Elon Musk, this game's for you. Being born in the early 2000s, I never got to experience the early internet. Fortunately, because I was a kid during early YouTube, I was still able to discover all sorts of new and exciting communities online which, depending on who you're talking to, is either easier or harder nowadays. Because of that, I always had an urge to remotely experience how the internet was in the early 90s. A world of video games truly becoming mainstream, and a world learning to adapt to having access to any and all information in the form of a box inside of their house. And from what I can tell, there is one game that catches that mentality while adding their own little spin to it, and that game is Hypnospace Outlaw. Hypnospace Outlaw is a look back at late 90s internet, as you solve mysteries and internet crimes by using popular methods back then, such as getting help from your virtual pet, downloading malware and ransomware, and searching through countless blogs and personal websites for even the slightest hint as to where you need to look next. Easily my favorite part of the game is going through every website when they got unlocked, and just absorbing a new community of people. In this game you'll find older folks with no experience and a stubborn attitude, teens who are passionate, creative, and sometimes desperate for attention, an evolving musical community that splinters when drama arises and new trends emerge, and much more. The world building is excellent, the music is phenomenal, and the writing itself can range from goofy to genuinely heartwarming and sad. If you love simply exploring new worlds and love a challenging puzzle or two, I highly recommend Hypnospace Outlaw. I made a video talking about completing Super Mario Bros. Wonder in three days. If that somehow didn't show that it was going to be on this list, 
I worry about you. Finally, after years of the most bare bones and repetitive 2D platforming, Super Mario Bros. Wonder was such a breath of fresh air. It kept the movement and fundamentals of the new series that at least I greatly enjoyed, and gave it all a fresh coat of paint in terms of level design, power-ups, and the all-new wonder mechanic. Grab a wonder flower and enjoy whatever wacky, unique scenario every level has. I think one of my favorite parts is that, if you don't want to, every single wonder flower is optional, and that's just like, weirdly cool, like the levels still stand out on their own, but the wonder flowers add just so much more. The new badge system allows you to change up your platforming repertoire. While this system could be heavily improved, such as, oh, I don't know, not having only one slot and so you only use the new platforming moves instead of, have coins come to you. I don't get why they give you only one badge when, like, that makes two-thirds of all the badges in this game completely pointless. What we have now is a great step forward and hopefully can become a mainstay and evolve in future Super Mario Bros. titles. I just really hope that in those future titles, they make the bosses have any form of challenge. I know this is a Mario staple of the bosses never really being difficult, but Bowser Jr.'s fights in this game were sometimes interesting but simplistic. It would have helped if we had, I don't know, the Koopalinks, because then with Wonder Flowers, they can actually be unique in their own personalities and styles. Not to mention the airship bosses just being complete jokes. You literally could just cut them out and just put a flagpole at the airship, and it, you would have no difference. It, you wouldn't lose a single thing. Even though those are genuine complaints that I do want to see improved in later games, I can't help but completely ignore them when playing Mario Wonder. Because what we have is innovative, varied, has one of the best soundtracks in the series, has some genuine challenge outside of the bosses, and in general is just fun to play. It has its hiccups. That much is certain. But I think regardless, this is not only the best 2D Mario game we've had since Super Mario World, Mario Bros. Wii bias aside, this is easily one of the best games that I played this year. Attention Rescue Corps! One of our Huckatate Freight Pilots has been stranded on planet PNF 404. This should be an easy in and out, so prepare to help your fellow Huckatate. Shit! They got stranded too. Hmm. Oh, oh, hey, uh, new kid. Look, there is this really cool planet, and it's totally safe. Pikmin 4 has your create a character rescue not only Captain Olimar, but also your own rescue team, with the help of every Pikmin from the series alongside new allies like the Ice Pikmin, Glow Pikmin, and your new doggy companion Ochi. Ochi acts as a second captain, similar to Louie in Pikmin 2, but this Louie can jump, attack without Pikmin, and can even do a charge run that can shortly stun enemies. He can even be upgraded through getting skill points, which can be obtained by either exploring the game's caves that make a comeback after Pikmin 2, or in the night levels that play as a pseudo-tower defense of terror. <laughs> Every world in Pikmin 4 was really satisfying to not only look at, but to also explore in order to find every treasure hidden within. Collecting treasure is necessary to unlock further worlds in the game, so making sure to use your time wisely in picking the right mint for the job is key. Outside of the lock-on making most of this game a button masher and a lot of cool upgrades being useless after completing the game and not having a new game plus, Pikmin 4 is a love letter to the entire franchise. Even as someone who's never played a Pikmin for more than a few hours before 4, I was so blown away simply from the game's demo that from start to finish, even I had an amazing time. Just, uh, don't look at all the resets I did to make sure as little of my plant babies died horrifically. As always, there will be some games that just didn't make the cut, but they definitely deserve at least one sentence about them. Before we get to number one, let's get started with some honorable mentions. If you just hate going through your backlog and need something to completely take over your life for months on end, Vampire Survivors is for you. With its simple gameplay combined with an absolute fuck ton of collectibles and secrets, you won't even realize that it's 3am. You need to go to bed. You need to go to bed. Nightmare, nightmare, nightmare. Not even mentioning the amazing music that will drill multiple addictive holes into your brain. My favorite is... <laughs> Yeah.
Quest of Loathing is one of the most charming and well-written text-focused RPGs I've ever played. Set in the Wild West, you'll travel all over killing clowns, cows, colts, corpses, and watch shit hit the fan along the way. Depending on your stats, you can access or miss out on many scenarios that are so well-written, it brings a tear of comedic joy to my eye. If you're a bit of a D&D fan, specifically people who weirdly only play as a cowboy bard, West of Loathing is for you. Finally, there's Deep Rock Galactic, one of the only games that I believe does live service in an actually cool way. With some of the most fun co-op shooting I've ever had since Left 4 Dead 2, Deep Rock Galactic has you go deep underground with your friends as you kill bugs, mine, or, and more. It's fun to mess around with all four of the classes and even single player is a treat. There's events happening all the time and the only battle pass inside is completely free and rewards you for simply enjoying the game that you bought, which is a breath of fresh air and gives me more hope for the industry compared to most of the games like it. Whew. Funny bit. Awful to record though. And this is where uh, I've taken so long to edit this video that uh, a lot of things have changed. So originally I was going to just, before we get to number one, make a quick thank you to every developer that has made this year absolutely amazing because of course, this could never happen without any of them. Even though this year has been absolutely amazing for games, it has been actually just disgusting for developers as a bunch of layoffs happening in places like Microsoft, Riot Games, and more have taken place. Uh, Bungie as well, I think, was another notable one that took place last year. And unfortunately, it looks like the AAA gaming bubble, just in general, looks like it's going to burst. And so, first of all, my massive sympathies go out to those that have been let down as of 2023 and those that are being let go for the year to come in 2024. These games cannot be done without you and your hard work, sweat, and dedication have been put into these games that we are enjoying so much. I'm terribly sorry that this has happened, and I really hope that those devs that were let down are able to get careers in the future, where hopefully, you know, we can actually have a good year for video games, not only for the players, but for the devs that make the games in the first place. We can't have video games this good without them, and so for that, I just want to say, before we get to number one, thank you. You are the reason that we can do this in the first place. Thank you. With that out of the way, let's get to the best game I played in 2023. This year has been such a good year for video game releases. One of these games that I believe deserved a lot more credit, at least when talking about major events like the Game Awards, was Spider-Man 2. Insomniac Games, a game studio well known for its cybersecurity and money management, did an amazing job adding even more content to the world that people have played in for years now. With Peter and Miles being their own unique characters, both being playable in this title, this is easily the most ambitious and variety-heavy Spider-Man game we've ever had. And it's not the one I'm talking about today. You see, I am no mere mortal. I am the Lovecraftian force of nature that decides to instead spend nearly 100 hours platinuming the first two Spider-Man games before ever setting my grimy gamer grippers on the newest title. And boy, when I started Insomniac's first foray into Marvel Spider-Man, I did not by any means expect it to be one of my favorite games of all time, let alone the game that I enjoyed playing the most in 2023. Marvel's Spider-Man, which I will lovingly refer to as Insomniac Spider-Man for the rest of this video, is one of the only open-world video games that I actually enjoy. I'm a bit of a less is more kind of person, but somehow, Spider-Man strikes a balance that I didn't know I needed in spades. As the story of Spider-Man inevitably saving the day unfolds, you'll unlock new collectibles and new side objectives scattered across Manhattan, all of these giving you the currencies to upgrade your spider gadgets and access to new spider suits. To customize not only your spectacular spider drip, but also your own unique playstyle. Do you want to systematically pick apart your foes in stealth mode one by one? Or are you a bloodthirsty bastard that wants to go in web swinging? Or are you the aerial acrobat that wants to zip from wall to wall and not give a single shit about where the enemy wants to bash your skull in? Well, you have the ability to do that. All you need to do is start swinging and get that bag. Or in this specific case, backpacks. While there is a lot to do with Spider-Man, with it being an open-world game, I never felt overwhelmed with choice. Whenever a new side objective became available, I immediately stopped whatever I was doing and did everything I could humanly do before only advancing the story remained. I've never had this pure obsession before. It's as if instead of Spider-Man making a deal with Satan and getting divorced, that is a real Spider-Man comic, by the way. He made a deal with Satan, and it led to his webs being shot right into my eyes, making them stick to my screen and never wanting to look away. Just, uh, 
don't think too much on the visual aspect of that. The combat is super satisfying, especially when you've maxed out the skill tree and get access to a huge variety of moves at your disposal. You'll throw rockets back at crooks while you're throwing goons at the sky to beat the shit out of them, all while you set out your distraction clones, making sure the only thing your enemies hear is okay, look I know every reviewer says this, but the swinging is both effortless and satisfying to use. It's probably one of the single best traversal methods in a video game that I've ever had the pleasure to use and master. Yet it never stopped me from every now and then simply walking through the streets of New York and saying hi to my adoring public. All while taking the time to enjoy the beautiful graphics and lighting, at least when it comes to the version that I played the coincidentally named Game of the Year edition. If you somehow weren't convinced that I might like this game a bit too much, the last trophy I needed to platinum the game was the one given to you for using the fast travel system. I enjoyed exploring this world so much, I barely ever fast traveled, only to do the last three or four times necessary to get the Platinum Trophy! After exploring the world, after fighting every fight possible, after clearing every single challenge that the game had to offer, the last thing I needed to do was ride the fucking subway! Have you ever had a game or piece of media introduce itself to you at the right time? Because I would be lying if that wasn't a huge reason for this game being number one on this list. I played this game at a time when I was struggling at my own job, even to the point that while I was finishing the game, I got fired. Because of this, I can't help but draw parallels to this game's world, where it beats you down until all that's left is what you decide to do next. Granted, Peter's dealing with way worse scenarios than I'll ever have to face. But, at least compared to the stress that I was dealing with at the time, not only did Spider-Man feel like a warning of what was going to happen in my real life, but also felt like an example of how I needed to react to what was going on in my real life. When I saw those credits, I bawled my eyes out. I knew after playing a game that affected me so much, not even mentioning my real life scenario, I was going to enter an uncertain time. Once I turned off my PlayStation 5, I had a nagging question. At the end of the day, what will you take from this experience? The answer I got, as silly as it sounds, was to simply keep being a good person. Similar to Peter's journey throughout Insomniac Spider-Man, I want to make sure, now more than ever, that whatever happens next never puts me in a place that forbids me to simply help others and be a good person. Because quoting Aunt May, when you help someone, you help everyone. And because of that, Insomniac Spider-Man is the single best game I have played in 2023. Possibly one of the single best games I've ever played. And I'm not gonna lie. There is absolutely no contest.